Rebecca Donegan here with a new episode of Workshopped It, which is a new series I'm trying out where I take a book that's already been published and I talk about what I liked and different elements I thought we could change just a little bit or brainstorm slash workshop a little bit just to take that story and bring it to the next level. It's a little bit like a combination of a reader's opinion on a book and a writer's group workshopping a draft. Um, all together in one. Rejected Mate by Caitlin Andrews. This is a book that's available on Kindle Unlimited right now. It's also available in ebook format. A little bit about Caitlin Andrews before we get started. She is a young author. Um, she originally started on Wattpad, but she moved her work, specifically this book, which is book two, over to Amazon recently this year. Um, she has a Wix website, and it doesn't give a lot of information about her. It just explains that she's really passionate about her creative writing and that she also feels strongly about her faith. Uh, the website's a little bit out of date, so I don't want to use it too much for detailed information. But it just sort of confirms that she's the author, both in the Wattpad and here on Amazon. Then some basic stats about this story. It is 137 pages long and it's for ages 13 to 18, which makes it a young adult paranormal romance sort of story. The other thing that's worth noting is this cover is fire. I love this cover. Everything about this cover is perfect as far as I'm concerned. You've got the young girl giving the smile, mysterious look in an interesting outfit. You have the two wolves in the background, you know, giving us that shifter romance pack sort of feeling. And of course there's the full moon right here up top. Pretty much everything I want in a cover of this kind of book. Um, I knew right away when I saw this book if the summary was even kind of a little bit good, I wanted to read it. I know we're not supposed to judge books by their covers, but I certainly do end up picking up some uh, just because of the cover. And this is one of them where the cover went a long way to selling me on this. And now I just want to go ahead and go right to the website and give you guys a summary. I'm going to read it out loud. Emma is a werewolf. She is the pack's punching bag and slave alongside with her best friend Haley. Her pack blames Emma for her parents' death when really hunters killed her parents. The hunters were going to kill Emma too, um, but they did hear her pack coming. The only reason they stay, the only reason they stay with their pack or for their mates. One night they found their mates, but they get rejected. So they finally have had enough and leave the pack. They run and run until they find, are found by two girls, weak and tired. They took them in and they got accepted into the pack. They return to their old pack, strong, beautiful, and face the mates that reject them, but they want them back. Uh, will they give in? Will they give them another shot, or will they accept their rejection? So, there are a couple of things I want to say about this summary right away. First of all, I did pick up and read the book. Part of it was the cover, and part of it was like the summary was like, eh, good enough. So, summary's meant to bring me in, meant to get a reader. Check mark. Success there. Some of the things that interested me specifically in this summary was number one, uh, there was some mystery going on in the summary. I knew that Emma's parents had died and that she was blamed for their death, but I didn't know why. Is she a rebellious teen who sort of got her parents into trouble? Was she running away from home and they were going to get her and they stumbled these hunters? Um, you know, I don't know. These are just some ideas I have off the top of my head, but these kind of relationship dynamics, these kind of dramas can be really cathartic to read. So I was ready to dig into that mystery, find out more, find out more about how she's blamed for the death of her parents, how she takes responsibility for that, what that means for her family and her pack as a whole. Uh, the other thing I liked is when Emma and Haley run away, they are found by two other girls, which means that we have now a total of four girls who are holding main leads. So I was expecting some great female relationships, some friendships, maybe a bi-lesbian romance, um, just great chemistry, interaction, and a lot of different kinds of women um, stepping in and taking roles. So for me that was great because I'm always looking for that female lead. Then there's the revenge, rejection, rejection, revenge style plot. I like that kind of plot. I'm totally here for it. So some cons. 
There are some serious grammar issues within this summary which makes me worried about the overall readability of the whole book. Uh, am I going to be able to read the book at all, you know? Or will there be grammar issues but not so much that I will put it down? I don't really know. Uh, it's never a great sign that when there's at least five grammar errors that I could see off the top in the summary. Uh, the other thing is I read this obviously in my head when I read the summary and in my head it made sense. I connected everything they were saying, but uh, reading it out loud you could probably tell it was quite hard to read. I stumbled a lot and I ad-libbed too. I didn't verbatim read the summary. Part of the reason I couldn't verbatim read it is because it doesn't make sense when you read it out loud and words are coming out of my mouth. Obviously I'm doing a video for you guys. I want it to make sense when I'm done. So I'm on the fly changing things to try and make the general gist of this summary come across as opposed to what was actually written on the page. Uh, the other thing I didn't like is just the casual drop of the best friend Haley. Just like, hey, Emma's got a reason that people don't like her and also they don't like her friend. <laughs> Makes me think her friend is not going to be a fully fleshed out character. She's just kind of there to play second fiddle and be like, oh, girl has friends. Uh, the use of the word slave in the first line of the summary, I don't care for that. I don't like, unless we're actually talking about trafficking, the use of the word slavery or slave in a story it feels um, inappropriate and really cringy to me. Um, and it just sort of sets the tone for maybe this being melodramatic or um, over the top in ways that I'm just not going to enjoy. Alright, so those were some pros and cons of the summary. And without further ado, let's dive right into the book. First, we're going to start off with a prologue, which just is a reading tip and a writer tip. When I am a reader, I usually skip the prologue. I will read maybe a paragraph or two of it just to see what's going on. And if it's not immediately interesting or relevant to the summary, I just move on to the first chapter of the book and I don't come back. Um, Maybe not all readers are like that, but a lot of readers nowadays are pretty impatient. Come on up. And <laughs> if they are, you know, they want to jump into the car race, they don't want to start filling up the tank. Um, so if you have something that is actually relevant, begins in the beginning of the book, then go ahead and make it chapter one. And if you're finding you have like a lot of exposition and you do think it's really relevant later in the story, just go ahead and try and fit it in in little chunks later, but start with something that grabs your reader's attention right away. And another quick formatting thing, and I won't go too much into formatting or grammar in this review at all, that's really a second pass editing, and workshopping is more story um, plot, so character development scenario, but one formatting thing is it does say Emma's POV right here at the top, and I'd prefer just to say Emma without the POV part. Um, and we get the same idea without all that extra vernacular. Right? It opens up with, My name is Emma Crow. I am 17 and 5'6". I have blonde hair and blue eyes. I am fat, ugly, and I am the pack's punching bag. I am also a werewolf and in the Snow Mountain Pack. You know, they say werewolves are supposed to be pretty, skinny, and fast. I am none of those. So I don't love opening with character description. I don't really love when you describe characters at all unless it's immediately relevant. And even then, like, a one-line detail that will get me there. Don't give me a character bio sheet. And then the other thing is this is just a funny line. They say werewolves are supposed to be pretty skinny and fast. Who says that? When have you heard that? As, like, a traditional kind of monster, a uh, character, werewolves are usually considered uh, vicious, aggressive. I guess fast is true. It can be fast. Um, but not pretty skinny and fast. And even in a romantic setting, a lot of times they're strong, they're outdoorsy, they're a little bit primal or whatever, but they're not necessarily pretty skinny and fast. Those usually aren't in the top three. Well, fast maybe, but pretty and skinny. Probably not in the top 10 descriptors of what you're looking for in a werewolf shifter romance story specifically. But anyways, the prologue goes on to talk about her siblings. It lets us know that her parents died three years ago to hunters um, when she was 14. She was there. She watched them be killed. 
So she's got like a Batman, Bruce Wayne backstory. Except for some reason here, instead of her being scarred and other people feeling bad for her, she's scarred for life mentally and everyone blames her some, for some reason. That's not quite clear because I don't know what they expected a 14 year old to do in the situation. It's never really explained what she was supposed to do um, to prevent this attack or to help with it. Um, it is never explained uh, any of that. And a little bit here I think this is a bit of uncreative writing. Like there are a lot of reasons the pack might not like her. Um, with her parents alive, or with her parents dead, if you still want the parents to be dead, um, we already talked about a couple different ways you could kill them off, where she's at fault, or she has some culpability, like either she runs away, or she runs into trouble that leads to them, I don't know, maybe she had a romance with one of these hunter guys, and led them back in, and was betrayed by them, there are a lot of cool things you could do, even with the murdered parents part of the story. Um, but I will talk about some other ways that she could have made her main character, Emma, an outcast from the pack without killing off her parents. And in some ways, I think having parents treating a child badly for whatever reason can be even more impactful. It says even more. Um, so if you're looking for that angst or like that emotional scarring in your character, you can still get that without having murdered parents. She explains that her and her friend are both not treated well. She doesn't explain why her friend is included in this. Um, I guess because she decided to be friends, Emma's friend Haley decided to be friends with her, and that's why people don't like her. Not a great reason, but okay. Um, she's talking about they're both staying because they're looking for their mates, and neither one of them can transform into werewolves until they find their mates. If their mates accept them, then transformation is easy, and if their mates reject them, it's very painful. Go a little further into the story, you find out she does some research in the library and comes to find out if her mates reject her, which at this point in time the pack believes they will, there's like a 25% chance that she'll die. And there's actual percentages, um, death percentages, exception rate percentages, all of that within the text. Which I just think is great. It's really, <laughs> it's a lot to take in. Um, it makes me think of like an abstinence only sex education here except for werewolves because if everyone's got a mate and you don't transform into a werewolf until you find this mate and rejecting them gives a 25% death rate that feels like information you should be teaching kids in school along with their basic puberty stuff. Um, the fact that she had to go look this up in the library and read it from a book that she literally typed out for us um, as a honest to goodness book exposition dump um, is strange. I would have much rather sat in a health class with her and learned this information. It also makes me think that these young werewolves are not making informed decisions about their mates, uh, which has totally sidetracked me from romance, drama, or angst perspective. Uh, so just think about how you're delivering information to your reader. Does it make sense in a world where your character picked it up? And does it make sense for you to give that information right away? Uh, and really, couldn't we have found another reason for her to stay with the pack? Maybe she was too afraid to leave. And this mate situation was just, I don't know, another sidebar thing. Or maybe she was gathering supplies and she didn't have the right supplies yet. That would be great. Like her trying to sneak in and around the pack and grabbing the various items she needs. We could have a little bit of scavenger hunt. A little bit of like, you know, sneaking stealthy thief thing going on. Um, these are just some different ideas about why she's still here. You don't have to drag in things that I uh, think are less than ideal, especially in a young adult story. I don't think it's ideal that all of the young werewolves are not fully aware of their sexual identity and consequences. They don't get to transform into werewolves until they find their mates, and accepting or rejecting them has a lot riding on it which um, could translate into the real world, like if someone asks you to do a dance and you don't want to go, they don't have a 25% chance of dying if you say no. But the way this mate situation is handled is very similar, like if a guy or girl asks you to go to a dance. Um, so I just don't like that. I think some clarity on the issue would have been better and bringing it to the reader's attention in a different way. Probably creating some other reasons why she stayed would help.
in this situation. Yeah, but because she does spend a lot of time in the library, she also finds this interesting information about a super elusive pack that just everyone thinks is really cool. And she thinks she's part of it too. In this area, there's actually, to me, a huge missed opportunity because uh, people of the super exclusive pack have half moon tattoos on their wrists and they all have blue eyes and they can all talk to their inner wolf early. Like this could have built a real reason for the pack not to have liked her and to have ostracized her that had nothing to do with the death of her parents. Maybe they don't like differences, half moon tattoos, half moon birthmark situation is a difference that they think is a bad omen or they think makes her dangerous and then that's a reason that both her and Haley because she's also got the same birthmark on her wrist, are ostracized from the pack. Or maybe, you know, talking to your wolf early is seen as her being really crazy or unstable. Um, maybe the other wolves don't just don't understand what's going on. This is another reason that she could have had to be made fun of that didn't have anything to do with guilt over the murder of her parents and could have created some real tension and also could have created this great theme where, like, the things that made you different got you made fun of but they're also the things that um, brought you to a new place or that gave you new opportunities. It's not an original theme, but it's very impactful, especially when done well. And I just think it could have really elevated the story. So I'm going to go ahead and jump us over to chapter one now. There's not a lot more in the prologue. Basically, it sets up that she, um, Emma's a huge bookworm and also a really good fighter and Haley is really good at tracking and for some reason neither of the girls have to go to high school. I guess Emma doesn't go as a punishment and Haley just doesn't go because? Because she's not being punished. That's the part um, of the story at this point in time that's very confusing to me. They set up, no matter what you think of the setup, um, Emma is ostracized and punished because they feel she's responsible for the death of her parents in some way. But I have no idea why Haley is always with her and why Haley isn't allowed to be part of pack training and why Haley isn't allowed to go to school. Um, I guess it's just because she decided to be friends with Emma, which, you know, creates a whole other set of issues like why is Haley friends with Emma? We're into chapter one and chapter one actually does jump us right off into action. It starts with Emma's brother yelling for her to come downstairs. She's late for cooking the pack breakfast. Okay, so that's good. Um, it shows that Haley, well, that Emma has to uh, do a lot of chores for the pack and is really what that means um, at this point in time. Less telling us that she's ostracized in the punching bag and more showing us what that means. So in this case, it's her describing a full morning routine. Um, we could have probably done with less of the nitty gritty step by step. I don't have to know that she brushed her teeth for three minutes and then she showered, and then she dried off, and then she put her clothes on, and then she, you know, I didn't have to hear all those steps, but that's okay. Then they get to the breakfast scene, and the bre her making breakfast is also really detailed, and this is where my former food service team member knowledge comes into play, because his, Emma isn't cooking for a large family, she's cooking for a pack. And we've already established that a super small exclusive pack is 40 team members. So her pack, if that's super small and exclusive, let's say her pack is um, mid-range, 80 people, 75 people, and she's cooking for all of them. And I'm going to go ahead and assume that if you're cooking for 75 to 80 people in a pack-made house, you have an industrial kitchen. Um, and I'm also going to go ahead and assume you've got like a warmer, um, all the basic standard industry stuff. It's not ideal for one person to cook for 75 to 80 people. Um, usually you'd want at least two people doing it, even if it's something simple like breakfast, a buffet style breakfast. But I mean, it could be done. I can't imagine a 17 year old doing it, but it could be done. So she makes eggs and bacon and pancakes and the order she makes it in is totally wrong. She cooks the eggs first, and then the bacon, and then the pancakes, which, number one, if you're cooking for a lot of people, or even if you're cooking for like 
just you and a partner. Do not cook your eggs first. They will be cold by the time the rest of the food is out and no one likes cold eggs. Even in an industrial kitchen where you have a warmer that you can put the eggs in, you really don't want to cook the eggs first because they dry out. So like if I made scrambled eggs and even if I added a little liquid egg in there, a little milk in there and put it in the warming pan, which you shouldn't do for food safety reasons, but um, it's a shortcut, spoiler alert, that sometimes people take. Um, the eggs are going to dry out. They might stay at temperature, but they're going to be dry and gross. It's not going to be good for your customer, and it's also going to be a pain for you to clean when you have to wash, rinse, and sanitize that pan later, no matter how much uh, pan you've sprayed on it ahead of time. So don't cook your eggs first. Um, and also, why would you cook your pancakes last? Like, they can also, it cools down pretty quickly. Um, the right way to do this is for you to bake the pancakes, to cook the pancakes first in the flat top griddle. And while the pancakes, you're flipping and doing all that, you should lay out your trays of bacon and you should bake them in the oven. You shouldn't cook them on the stove top. You should bake them in the oven. It takes about three minutes to flip depending on how you set the oven. Once your pancakes are done, Stacking them up in the tray will keep them warm. Shove them in the warming tray. Take your baking, collect it out into the warming tray. Those will hold. Then last, you're going to do those eggs. You're going to scramble them up. You're going to put them in the pan. And then ideally, if you've timed it all right, you can go ahead and put it all out onto the buffet line or onto the serving table, just depending on how you're doing this, um, with eggs hot and fresh and with the pancakes and the bacon still at a pretty good temperature thanks to the warming the warming tray you've kept them in. Uh, so usually I wouldn't give that kind of level of detail, but our author did, and it just really bothered me how wrong it was that she explained each step of what you would do. And first of all, she made it like it was in a regular kitchen, which doesn't make any sense for how she's described this, described the task. And she also said it got done in 40 minutes, which uh, would not you probably couldn't get all of that done in 40 minutes. Uh, it just confused me. I didn't like it. Um, I get what she's trying to do. She's trying to show the kind of hurdles that are in Emma's life that she has to do every day, presumably three times a day. Breakfast is the easiest meal to cook. It only gets harder from there um, if you're doing a hot lunch for them. But it just didn't work. And especially where there are so many people who have food service experience, and they probably do have some form of making a uh, mass-produced breakfast, they would know this is not the way those steps work, and this is not how, how long it would take or what you would do to set that up. And the other thing that was interesting here is she says that she can't eat until the others are done, and she has to eat whatever they leave over, and that a lot of times they don't leave anything left for her. In fact, it's already happened three times. And this is hilarious to me because she's been doing this routine for three years. So them eating all the food and having nothing left for her three times in three years is actually not that often for this to be a trial. So instead of making it seem like she goes without meals a lot, she's really hungry all the time, she's sort of fighting for what she gets, you just make it sound like she's whiny. Um, you know, I think maybe saying it happens at least once a week would make sense. But even then, where she's cooking all the food and she's cooking it by herself alone in the kitchen, I just don't understand why she doesn't put a plate back before she serves everything out to them. And then she could eat in the kitchen, and instead of just chilling there in the background and waiting for them, she could wash all the pots and pans, because there's a lot of cleanup that has to be done for this kind of thing. And then she could pick up their stuff and put that away too. Um, and that's really pretty much the end of chapter one. Oh, both of them also find out who their mates are for realsies and get rejected. And now we're at the end of chapter one. I know that seems like not a lot to describe that section, especially since it's the whole premise and title of the book, but that's about how much time it's given here in the chapter. Uh, they do all this step-by-step -step explaining of getting ready and making food, and it's pretty quick about the boyfriend <laughs> saying no, he doesn't want to be boyfriends. And here we are now, they put a note out and they left. Packing was really quick and easy. And they're out the door, they're on their way. Here we go, let's get ready for chapter two. Okay, so we're into chapter two and the girls are on the run. And literally just like in the description, they run for a while, 
they end up shifting into their wolf form. It really hurts. And the two girls find them and bring them back to the pack home. Let's see. And then we're at chapter three. I know that wasn't a lot of information. I don't have a lot of feedback one way or the other on that chapter. It does jump from Emma's perspective to Rebecca's perspective, which is new. So maybe I should have some thoughts on it, but Rebecca isn't a very different tone of voice than Emma is. And I think the only reason that we swap to Rebecca's point of view is because the two girls passed out from pain when they transformed into their werewolves. And Andrews wasn't sure how they were going to find these this other pack if these girls didn't come and get them. And the other thing that's worth noting with this white wolf pack and the white walls is that there has been a lot of focus in this book with things being white and with people having blue eyes. And it, at this point in time where we're only three chapters in, it's making me a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, it definitely wasn't the author's intention. It's definitely an unintentional thing. And I understand um, with the traditional good and evil roles in fantasy and with like someone who maybe had a little, you know, grew up with Barbies and had a little bit of like a Barbie girl mentality where these character creations come from and it's not necessarily a bad place but um for me as a reader it feels like it there's a lack of diversity and a lack of thought being put into the color descriptions and the ideas going on here and I would just like to see a more diverse character or for us to choose a different color for symbolism purposes um with wolves I guess it would be hard just because there's only so many different colors of wolves, but maybe like a gray wolf or a silver wolf um, instead of a white wolf would have been cool. Uh, I like black wolves too. I think they're cool. In a bunch of these shifter novels that I've been reading, the wolves have all different kinds of colors like tawny and gold and brown and different kinds of spots and stuff. The wolves are often treated more like um, dog coats than they are like wolf coats. I'm fine with that, you know, but you could like mix it up like that. And as long as you're going with something that seems unbelievable, like everyone having a moon birthmark on their wrist, why don't we just give them a really specific fur pattern too when they're in their wolf form, even it out. I don't know, just a thought and a way for you to break up some imagery that starts to become unfortunate uh, pretty early in. So the people explain to her where she is, which we as the readers already know, and they just re-describe everything that we have read in chapter three. And now we're into Jackson's point of view, which is sort of interesting because Jackson is the guy that rejected Emma. So this is Emma's ex-mate, I guess, at this point in time. So he says, after I walk away, I actually feel bad for her. No one should have to go through rejection, but sometimes life is not fair. I saw her tears came to her eyes, but she tried to hold them back. My wolf whimpered when he saw that. Okay, so we're seeing that Jackson is kind of conflicted about the choice he made. I don't like this line, no one should be rejected. I know we're talking about mates, um, but Emma's already given us the stats on that, and 40% of all mates are rejected. So actually you have close to a 50-50 chance of your your first mate or whatever this is rejecting you. And um, that's fine, but it's a long way from no one being rejected. And then if you take the, the phrase no one should be rejected and think about presenting that idea to a 13 to 18 year old, it becomes more concerning because they're just navigating consent and dating dynamics. And I don't want the message that it's not okay to say no to someone out there in the world. I do realize the circumstances here are a little different, but I don't like it. You know, I just don't think it's appropriate for this age group to put that message out, no matter what the circumstances. Um, there is a, rom a romantic tenant going on here. I guess mates are supposed to be together for life. It hasn't really been explained yet what they're supposed to do, but I think it's like marriage, um, just off of my basic werewolf knowledge, <laughs> if you will. 
And if that's the case, like, you bump into this person, even if you've known them beforehand. But, like, I don't know, this kid that maybe you went to grade school with or whatever, and now you guys are teens, and you bump into them, and one day sparks fly, and you're like, oh, let's get married. I mean, they have a right to say no to that. And the fact that his, he's conflicted, this is actually pretty normal, and shift your stories that are romantic where there's like a human side and a wolf side and the wolf side recognizes right away who the right romantic partner is and it's the human side that needs a stern talking to if you will i guess it's about how human ego gets in the way of things that are naturally good for you which is an interesting concept um so the wolf is kind of berating him and like you shouldn't have rejected her, and you're stupid, and I want to hang out with her. And then he's like, it'll be good, I'll talk to her later. And that's when he finds the note that Emma and Haley left. And he realizes that they're not coming back. And then we jump over here to chapter 4, Miles. And uh, Miles is a brand new character. So I'm going to go ahead and read the first paragraph here. After Tommy left, I walked down the halls. I was not watching where I was going, and I bumped into something hard, and I fell on the ground. Ow, that hurt, I said, rubbing my temple. I look up and saw this guy here looking at me with guilty expression. He had blonde hair and hazel eyes. He had a white shirt on and some blue jeans. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, he said, snapping my attention back to his face. The guy in my arm and I flinched back. He looks confused, but helped me up. My name is Miles, he said. So, this is really weird. I I thought we were doing Tom Miles' perspective, but I think what's going on is we're actually back in Emma's perspective, even though, again, we didn't get in a switch over to her point of view. Um, yeah, because here it is. Um, my name is Emma, but you can call me M. And then he smiles. So I guess we're meeting another love interest here because he's talking about what a beautiful name and can he take her out for ice cream as an apology. So we're in chapter four. They've been gone from the pack a day, day and a half, and Emma has a new love interest. And not only do they go out for ice cream, but they actually go to a carnival. So that's pretty cool. I like carnivals. So this is a great jeep, Miles. And I actually think the carnival is a great potential scene. I don't think it's used to its fullest context here. Um, and maybe it doesn't work so well now in 2020. But if you're doing like a modern day setting, just not in the year 2020, either pre-COVID or post-COVID, or maybe even during COVID, I know there are some carnivals going on and there might even be some interesting things um, to explore in a book realm for your characters to go there. Uh, it's just fun, you know, there's some bright lights, there's colors, there's music, there's special kinds of food that's there, there's carnies. There's a whole bunch of different groups mixing together that might not usually hang out. Carnival is a great place for a lot of different things to happen. So I like that scene. Okay, so Miles and Emma, they go to the carnival, they have a great time, they kiss. We're into chapter five, and it is a hard jump to three years later. I kind of like this, um, mostly because it seems like everything before has concluded pretty cleanly. The girls were in a bad situation, they got out of it, and now they're in a better situation. I have a couple of questions about the Miles being interested in the Emma scenario, just because Miles, we're led to believe that Miles is a good guy. And if he is a good guy, and if no one should be rejected, then what is he doing fooling around with Emma, who he knows is not his mate, which means he's going to have to reject his mate when he finds them. Or he's going to have to dump Emma, I guess. That's a possibility too. And uh, pick up with his chosen mate. So I do have some questions with that resolution. Um, I think the whole faded mate's rejection uh, scenario has created a lot of problems that aren't handled well. And I've actually read quite a few faded mate stories at this point in time with a rejection theme in them. Usually the solution to this is that uh, the other person is on their second faded mate as well. 
you know, either their significant other also rejected them, or they died, or they went crazy, something like that. Which means that both of these people have already been with their, been with, or been rejected by their first mate. And now they're on to their second chance, second mate. But that's not what's happening in this story. Um, I guess another thing that could have been explored is the idea that you could have more than one faded mate. So like, this was the first one you bumped into and it didn't work out. But like, hey, your wolf can be interested in more than one guy or girl. And um, that first relationship didn't work out. It's not like there aren't more. Um, my mom once told me that men are like prom dresses. A lot of them might look nice on, but you've got to find the one that looks the best on you and at the right time, in the right place, and for the right price. And <laughs> I've always kind of liked it because it sort of implied um, just that there's a lot of potential for relationships and there's a lot of factors that go into them, not just love, um, but timing and um, people's emotional and mental health and their stability. It'd be nice to see that reflected in this whole mate scenario as well. It's something that they could have explored here. They could have found a magical reason for it, or they could have found some kind of instinctual level reason. Or maybe it could have even been something that was special about Emma in specific, where she has a lot more options than other people have. I don't usually like that, like, I'm a special one and everything that happens to me is because I'm special. But uh, it probably would have been better than this. And then just closing with nice guy Miles kissing Emma, even though it was going to lead to a problem that we've already established is super bad, or at least when it happens to Emma and Haley. So it's been three years, and it seems like this book so far has been pretty PG-13 with its descriptions. Like, it's been like, and then I kissed them. Then they held my hand. So uh, I don't even think mating is code for sex, I think. It's code for any kind of intimate act that happens past French kissing. The good news is we got a pack to... Okay, so there's more hunters in the area. It's endangering the white wolf pack because they're so small. And the good news is that they got a pack to agree to let us stay at their pack house until the rogue hunter problem is fixed. Um, but the bad news is that the pack they're going to go stay with is Emma and Haley's old pack. So here we are, three years later, what are we going to do? We're going to have to go back. So Miles is sad for Emma, but he's going to try and support her. And one of the ways he's going to support her is he's going to have one of his girlfriends, friends who is a girl, girlfriend, make, give, give Emma an amazing makeover. So then we spend a chapter on an amazing makeover. And it's really kind of pretty woman, pretty woman style makeover. Then we go into chapter seven, where they meet the pack for the first time. Everyone seems to be surprised. Okay, so now we're at the part where both packs have met and it is time really for like our, our first one-on-one -on -one meeting between the rejected mates. So they go to this party where all the packs are, which is a bit of a surprise given that they just found out that they were hosting their rejected girlfriend's packs, but whatever, I guess they're being gracious about it and they're still having a big party. And um, Emma's really discombobulated about it, but then all of a sudden Haley comes up to her and she's really excited and she lets Emma know that she ran into the guy who rejected her and they had a really great talk and he apologized for rejecting her and now they're dating again, which is a little bit awkward because Haley had a boyfriend in the new pack too. Um, but it's okay because Haley's old boyfriend, um, he found his mate and he said yes to her. So now Haley is dating her original mate and her ex-boyfriend is dating his mate who's part of the pack. So everybody is happy, good times all around. Except for Emma, who is really mad at Haley for just accepting some lame apology and getting back together with him. She's like, he really hurt you. How do you know he's telling the truth? What makes you think he means it? Um, the whole nine yards. Several pages long of just like angry, angsty 
um, rant where Haley eventually just sort of cuts her off and is like, hey, I'm an adult, I can make my own decisions, I can do my own thing, and this is what I want to do. And, you know, technically Haley's right, so I guess good for her. She um, decided that she was going to hang out with her original mate after all. And right after Haley leaves, Emma's old mate approaches her, and he gives her the same line, like, hey, I'm really sorry I treated you badly, I really like you, and can we maybe, you know, get a coffee or something sometime? And Emma is like, oh, hell no, at first. And then about three sentences in, she thinks about what Haley said, and basically in her mind relives a conversation we just had, and decides that her and her ex-mate Jackson can be friends, but they're not going to go to dating right away. They're just going to, you know, get forgiven and see how friendship works. Which is fine. And meanwhile, Emma's new boyfriend, Miles, has found his mate. So Emma and Miles break up. Which is going to be really awkward because they were staying in the same room. And I don't know if they have enough rooms or what Emma's going to do now. But that's, that's a detail for later. Because at this point in time, Haley comes up to her. And Emma relives the story we just heard about Jackson again. Except instead of Haley being happy that they're both on the same page, she starts yelling at Emma about accepting Jackson's apology and how Jackson can't be trusted. And when I got to this part in the story, my mind broke a little bit. And I had to flip back a couple pages and see if this story had just played out with Haley only, Haley was happy and dating her ex and Emma was yelling at her. And yep, that is what happened. And now we're having the same scene, only Haley is yelling at Emma about agreeing to be friends with her ex. So that's totally out of character and weird. And this is really for me where the story starts to fall apart. And it's not just these out of character moments because the author does go on to find like things that explain it later in the story. It's just like things start to happen really quickly. They don't seem to make any sense. And stuff that like was established before, um, now things are just happening without any establishment. Like from here we find out that Rebecca, who is one of the two girls who originally um, found Emma and Haley when they ran away from their mates. And also, Rebecca is the same girl who gave Emma her sweet, pretty woman makeover before she came to this pack again. Uh, she's a witch, and she wants to destroy Emma. It's fascinating, considering she saved her by bringing her to the new pack, and also gave her a really great makeover. And now she is a witch who is controlling Haley, and wants to destroy and kill Emma. And we're not really quite sure why at this point in time. But we're getting all of this from journal entries because Emma has run away and other people are worried about her and they broke into her room and were reading her journal. This is especially interesting because the character who finds the journal reads it and we read it and then he goes out and finds the other friends and verbally reads the diary entry again. Back to back. Um, so if I had some advice for beginning readers, you want to cut this out. Uh, for starters, maybe don't deliver so much exposition from books. I'm really charmed in a lot of ways that um, Caitlin Andrews, the author here, wrote a character who's so bookish. I mean, I love that Emma loves libraries. I love that her first solution to problems is going to the library and studying. I love all the different things that Emma thinks she can find in books, along with like a surprising amount of information she does find through researching libraries. And I love that she is into journaling and record keeping and all kinds of stuff like that because I'm into those kind of things too. And it makes me think really fondly of the author, um, that she created a character who's like this. But as a reader, reading someone else's books within a book to get critical information is just not what I want to be doing with my time. And it's not enjoyable. It's not pleasant, and there's no world building. Like, until this point where we found out that em, em, that Rebecca is a witch through Emma's journal, we didn't even know witches were a thing in this world. There are werewolves, there are humans, and I think, and there are hunters who I believe were humans hunting werewolves. 
but like I didn't know there were any other fantasy races or beings within this universe. And with like werewolf and shifter stories, it is a mixed bag. You really don't know if you're gonna get a book that has all the different kinds of creatures or if you're gonna get just humans and werewolves. So this was a shock and considering there are no other witches around and no context, I expected it to be a little bit of a shock to our characters and when they were like, oh, she's a witch pretending to be a werewolf. Just, they just sort of like, okay, and they rolled with it, which is weird to me. I mean, I had a lot of questions like, can werewolf shape, can witches shapeshift? And if they cannot, then what has Rebecca been doing with these werewolves? How has no one ever seen her shapeshift? Also, Rebecca has a brother. Um, the, at this point in time, they've kind of seemed to, they haven't utilized him, so maybe he's been forgotten about, but she was asked originally in chapter three or four to go to the store by her brother to pick up some goods, which is how she found Emma and Haley. Um, so is her brother a witch too? Or is her brother a werewolf and she's a witch? Is she like half witch, half, you know, just a lot of questions. Uh, the other thing that starts to go off the rails is Emma starts to become this crazy chosen one and Emma and one of her brothers are actually not biological. They're brother and sister, but they have two other sisters that they're not, they're adopted basically is what I'm saying. And they didn't know they were adopted. And when they found out that they were adopted, they also found out all this crazy stuff about their backstory. And now instead of Emma being just a werewolf, she also can turn into a dragon and a fairy and a bunch of other creatures. And there's a bunch of other beings that are after her. And we sort of lose the plot line of the hunters. And now we're like fighting just crazy warlocks and stuff. And the whole pack thing goes away. We never get any closure with Miles. I don't think we see Haley again in this story. It just, it goes way off the rails. And at this point in time, I sort of start, stopped reading because I just, I didn't know what was happening anymore. None of this was in the summary. Um, the summary was about these two girls who were treated badly, were rejected by their mates, found a new pack that trained them up, and then they came back and made their mates jealous and or maybe decided to end up with them after all. So to conclude this first episode of Workshop that rejected me, what I would say could most improve this book, bring it to the next level, is to make it two, maybe three books, and just the first little third that we see here, turn that, lengthen that. Go ahead, maybe start, start when Emma's parents are alive. Let's go ahead, let's start there, and I think in my workshop book, Emma and her friend Haley are both struggling with some form of drug addiction and drug problem. And um, Emma's parents are desperately trying to intervene. She is the third of three, she's the third of four children and she is second youngest and they're really worried about her. You know, they're chasing her, they're following her around, they're trying to like find a way to get her to come clean. And while they're in the process of this, they stumble into this seedy neighborhood that Emma's in. She's like all strung out of her mind. She doesn't really know what's going on. Haley is there too. They, you know, they're both into this scene. As far as, I'm not sure what's going on with Haley's parents. Maybe they're absentee. Um, but anyways, Emma's parents are there. And they're trying to get them out of this den. And there's some arguments going on back and forth with like the dealers or whatever. And on their way home, this attracts attention of these werewolf hunters. And while Emma is strung out of her mind, they uh, attack and kill her parents and rob them all. And, you know, Emma's parents were not stupid. They warned the pack about what was going on and where they are going. So the pack comes in and they find Emma totally strung out of her mind. And, um, you know, covered in her parents' blood. And they're just, this is the initiating incident that causes a rupture. And I think I would label this chapter one and I would go ahead and I would just show the reader this from the get-go. Go ahead, show this violent scene happening. And you know, then we could flash forward to three years later where Haley's where Haley and Emma are both clean. They've gone through rehab. 
But, like, this is the loss of their parents was a huge loss. Maybe they were really important to the pack. Maybe there aren't that many adult uh, werewolves to start. They're just really upset. And, you know, they feel like Emma has a lot to make up for. She has a lot. She's brought a lot of shame to their pack and to her family. She just has a lot to do to prove herself. And Emma, too, she feels guilty. She's destroyed her family unintentionally. You know, that was never her intention. Um, all of that. So she's having this struggle go on. And now we can go ahead and start where this story begun, begins. And she's thinking, like, maybe the only thing she can do is leave and get a clean start. So she's been sort of, like, gathering supplies and looking for other places she could go. And the White Wolf pack in this story is going to be, like, a rehab, a rehab pack in general. Because even though she's been mostly clean this time, she still struggles. She still sometimes runs into those old buddies. And she just thinks a clean break is the best way to go. And, you know, on top of this, like... I feel like the drug issue could pair really well with some of the other things that are explored in this novel. Like the whole speaking to your wolf early thing. Like, is she really speaking to her wolf early or is she having delusions because of the drugs that she's taking? Um, some of the things that she thinks about herself, that like she's super powerful or that she has a mind link with Haley. Um, does she really have a mind link with Haley or is this another scenario of the drugs? Um, is she really powerful? Does she have these, like, special... You know, you could keep this question between uh, what is real with the reader um, uh, throughout the entire novel. And, you know, not just what the reader thinks is real versus what's really real, but what the pack sees versus what Emma sees. You know, and this could really create tension. This could create some intense dramas and relationships. And it could also explain why their mates reject them. You know, like... You might even really want to love someone who's in an addiction scenario and just, you know, you can't at that point in time because they'll drag you down. So here we go. And then once all of this happens and they get rejected by their mates, they realize they have nothing else going on and the only thing you can do is get clean. So now we go over to the other pack. And from here we've got like a whole redemption arc. Maybe part of it is getting more in tune with your wolf so now we can see when the wolf was talking and when it was a delusion. Now we can see um, her slowly getting stronger, those shakes going away. Maybe she's slowly starting to recover her memories, like she didn't know exactly how her parents had died before. We as the readers did, but she didn't know. And maybe her parents' death gives her more insight. And while all of this is going on, you know, she's developing relationships. I'd probably skip the relationship with Miles if she's going to get back together with her original mate. Um, but that's a, that's a choice that the author could make. And I just think from here, though, you've got, like, a far more stable scenario for this story. And you could really lengthen it out to its own book and create a full redemption arc that would lead them to going home. And maybe the two packs go home meet and go to their house to stay for some reason or maybe you know Haley and Emma finally complete this pack rehabilitation and they realize the last thing they have to do to get closure is go home and face all those things that were bothering them um and you that's where you could set the end of that book or you could you know send them home and then have an emotional meeting with the pack and conclude things there even have a romance with those two originally rejected mates if you wanted to. Um, and then the other stuff that happens, the witch and the fairy stuff, the dragon stuff, the warlocks, go ahead and save that for the next book. Um, but that's what I would do, is I'd really focus in on those relationships. I'd add some kind of theme, in my case I added a drug abuse theme, that like amps up the tension and the stakes and the emotion. I'd really try and wring that for all it's worth, since people who are coming to this kind of story are looking for an emotional journey. Um, but, you know, it was a very creative book, and there was a lot of potential. There were some things I liked, some things I didn't like. Uh, if this has piqued your interest, please do check out Rejected Mate on Amazon.com. Go ahead, support a fellow creator. And if there's a story you want me to read on Amazon.com, you know, recommend me. I'm always taking, looking for new things to read. And if you like this video or if you want me to look at something you've done, let me know. But please leave a thumbs up. And if you want more content like this, subscribe. Thanks, guys. Again, I'm Jessica Donegan, and this has been an ep episode of Workshopped.